Talking now to Umberto Fontova, Babalu blog. You can find him on a lot of sources. He's written some good books. And we're sort of wrapping up the NFL season a little later in Philadelphia than everywhere else. And uh, it was a conflicting one for me being an Eagles fan, but yet seeing what went on really in the early part of the season with uh, the kneeling during the national anthem. Not that any Eagles did that. And also for Umberto, who's in uh, the New Orleans area, and the Saints, like the Eagles, were a pleasant surprise this year, better than anyone expected. And I'm just reconciling this and just getting some thoughts about the season with uh, Umberto Fontova. What's going on? Very good, guys. Just getting ready for the horrible season, as we call it down there. Mardi Gras is next Tuesday, and the parades are already kicking off, but the weather's not cooperating. But we're watching it and uh, acting accordingly. It's a little early this year, so the I guess weather can be a factor based on, mm-hmm. I guess, it's the Jewish calendar. You base it off technically. Um, you know, that's when Easter is based on that, and the, or just the lunar calendar. And it is a little earlier this year than last year, but good luck with that. You still have uh, five days, I guess, or yeah, four, four, yeah, five till the big day. Um, what's your thought? I mean, were you conflicted like I was about your team doing, realizing halfway through the season that your team is doing really well, but just being kind of disgusted with the NFL? Yeah, I, I was. In fact, uh, I posted several posts at the time of the of the initial you know, taking a knee thing, mm-hmm. uh, using the old Rolling Stones hit, the, the first Rolling Stones hit, because I used to love her, but it's all over now. Right. You know, and of course, what, what, what when was that? Uh, late September, early early October when it happened? Yeah, I think when Trump made a statement in late and September, I, yeah. Yeah, and I kind of knew it would fizzle out a little bit, you know, as people's tempers were off, and, uh, and they did behave during during the Super Bowl, you know, so it wasn't, uh, a lot of people kind of sucked it up, you know, it's just too much of a of an American tradition to just completely shuck away because a few of the guys, mm-hmm. you know, the NFL, I think that's what happened, but I, after the Saints got, got knocked out tragically in the last few seconds, my goodness, you know, I kind of... Kind of turned off the NFL. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> so, uh, funny how that works. Oh yeah. my god! It was definitely easier to stick to your principles about the flag uh, if you were in, say, Tampa Bay or Indianapolis or especially like Cleveland this year. Uh, it just and, and I guess I wonder if there's a connection between how well teams did and uh, how uh, you know what happened with the whole support for Kaepernick thing. You see, on one hand, the Cleveland Browns were the only ones who did a black power salute during the anthem, and they went 0-16. Meanwhile, the Philadelphia Eagles never had anyone take a knee at any point during the entire season and won the Super Bowl for the first time. Right. First time. Won any kind of championship since 1960. As a matter of fact, I was remarking while watching the game uh, I was at the very first Saints game in September of 1967. Oh, wow. I had like, season tickets. The first I was at the time, I was 12 years old. I had season tickets like the first 10 years of the Saints franchise. And the very first team that the Saints beat was the Philadelphia Eagles. How many games did that take? Yeah, that would have been, that was in 1967. That would have been probably in November of 1967. They won three games that year. The first one was against Philadelphia, and then they beat Atlanta, which was also kind of a newbie team at the time, and they beat Pittsburgh, (laughs) which in 1967 wasn't much of a team. They weren't good. They were getting in a position to draft Terry Bradshaw. It was a very first victory. I'll never forget. I was watching it. Didn't they have a real St. Bernard as opposed to a guy in a St. Bernard costume at that point? No, not, not, not quite yet. Those kind of things hadn't, oh. hadn't really kicked in. It was, in fact, that was before the Dome. That was in Tulane Stadium at the time. Those were open-air games. Superdome didn't open until 1975, and, of course, I was there for that opening game. That was against Baltimore, so mm-hmm. I was there, too. And it only but, took 20 uh, more years until the Saints actually made the playoffs. Yeah, that was, that was just, I mean, the way they lost, we, we couldn't we couldn't believe it, because every game, you know, 
three games prior to that were all crucial, and they had all ended, you know, now in the last few seconds, you know, cardiac arrest and this and that and the other. And here it comes again. We thought we had it locked up. Boom. And that was it. Well, Umberto, do you think the NFL is at a crossroads now? I mean, do you think there are fans, a lot of fans that they've lost that are never coming back? I mean, I know they tried to blame it on white fans in particular, white male fans abandoning them. And, uh, it's an interesting thing. Obviously, Philadelphia, New Orleans, the boycott wasn't didn't have as much effect as other places. But no, no, I, I can tell you here that the rage, obviously, from October, early October, subsided. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it subsided in direct proportion to the Saints' success. Right. You know, when they started winning games and everybody, because they were, you know, and they started. I think they sensed the problem. And uh, because initially, you know, our guys had taken a knee to, mm-hmm. and even Coach Payton had said some pretty obnoxious things, mm-hmm. uh, obnoxious to the fans. You know, he was taken up for for the guys taking the knee. And even Drew Brees was kind of, yeah, of course, I can see Drew Brees, he's got to pass to these guys. He's got to hand off to these guys. You know, he's got to be buddies with right. them. So I can understand how they had to straddle the fence. But all of that annoyance or rage against them just kind of started dissipating as the season moved along and they started winning some extremely exciting games. But I do think, I mean, what what are the figures? I don't know. Best I can see that the uh, Super Bowl viewership was down, what, 20, 30% from last year? I, like I don't think it was quite that much, but... Uh, How much? It wasn't maybe 20%, maybe... Was it know, really 20%? Like now. Wow. I, I don't know, or maybe just overall viewership, but I remember that when I saw the statistics, I said, well, it's not as bad as people were predicting back in October. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it was the smallest audience in nine years when it was the the Saints in it, actually, uh, that year. But that year, it was a little, a little unusual in that New Orleans and Indianapolis have among probably two of the smallest fan bases of any teams. They're two of the smallest metropolitan areas in the Super Bowl. That could have been a factor in that one. Here, I think it's pretty significant. It is, but New Orleans fans have always been known as being actual fanatics. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that there aren't that many that, people. That was the case in 67. That was the case from the very beginning of the team. If you look at the attendance. Yeah. Uh, from the very beginning, New Orleans was, I mean, we're not really that big of a city. Yeah, exactly. You're but, like Jacksonville. Uh, but it is a fanatic, literal fanatics. Yeah. You know? yeah, but it's not the fanatics who make the ratings. It's the casual people in the suburbs. And there just aren't that many suburbs of New Orleans. I remember driving outside oh, New Orleans right. last time I was there about a year ago, like around Mardi Gras. And, like, mm-hmm. I was only 15 minutes outside the city limits, and I didn't realize it was, like, eight, nine miles Uh to a gas station, only like, it was pretty, you got to the country pretty quickly in New Orleans. I remember I had to help a guy who uh, had trouble getting gas. I had to sort of follow him, because it gets pretty rural pretty quickly out there. Yeah, well, rural, but but it's water. I mean, it's not pastures, it's it's marsh. Well, you know what I mean. And swamp and marsh and stuff, yeah, it's not not the rural that you would find up in in Pennsylvania where you got cows and hills and stuff. It's a little different, but it's rural. One more thing, Umberto, um, besides the political stuff, you caught something. I was looking at Babalu blog that I didn't see anywhere else. And obviously we're making fun of Tom Brady a little bit here in the Philly area. But uh, you caught something about Gisela, his wife, uh, that I didn't see anywhere else. So I'll let you tell people and people can look at it at Babalu blog. Well, and the funny part about it is that that is actually an old event. Giselle Bunchen, that's how you pronounce it. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Tom Brady's wife uh, is Brazilian. You know, she's, from what I hear, she's the world's top paid model, world's most popular model. And uh, she modeled part of her job, I guess, a bikini. And you can see this, folks. Hey, you can see Giselle in a bikini on Bob Luke Log uh, that was made up entirely of faces of Che Guevara. Mm hmm. Now, she did this back in 2002 in walking down the runway in her home city. I don't think it's her home city, but the capital of her home country, Sao Paulo, Brazil. 
Mm-hmm. And she's out walking out of my bike in this Che Guevara, gladly showing off Che Guevara, a mass murdering terrorist, uh, among whose most famous quips that I have brought to light is, America is the great enemy of mankind, and if the missiles had remained in Cuba, we would have fired them against the heart of the United States, including New York City. Mm-hmm. Against those hyenas, hyenas, Americans, there is no option but extermination. So I said, this is pretty interesting. So I made a pretty cool post with a picture of Tom Brady with his Make America Great Again cap, right? right. You see that picture? Yeah, he was. And then right next to him is his wife modeling the face of a guy who says, America is the great enemy of mankind and must be exterminated. <laughs> it is <laughs> pretty funny. Yeah, the only thing... <laughs> You end up thinking, like, well, what if you had a lot of beans for dinner and wore those things? You know, it's just like that is an area where you could sort of, you know, I don't want to get crude here, but you know what I'm saying. People were saying a lot of people were saying, so I, you know, because she's, she's in some of the pictures. And by the way, this happened in 2002, and these pictures were first, not first published, but first publicized, I should say, in my book, which came out 10 years ago, exposing the real Che Guevara. Those pictures of Giselle were in my wow. book. And so what happens is that since I hop on any opportunity to publicize and peddle my book, usually the best way to do that is with celebrity idiots, mm-hmm. you know, doing something Che Guevara oriented. So every so last year I did the same thing, same post, because it was Brady. Hey, how many of y'all know that Tom Brady, Tom Make America Great Again Brady's wife, Marvel Go says America should be exterminated. Mm-hmm. You know, that's bad enough. Like, I'll people say, well, come on, Myrtle, give, give, give the woman a break. She's a typical airhead model. She, and I wrote an article in Town Hall that people can dig up. And I said, you know, she probably has no clue who Che Guevara is. Yeah. You know, like most people, they, they don't have a clue. And then she does charity work and, and this kind of stuff. And I said, you know, she's probably a pretty halfway decent person. She doesn't have a clue what it is. On the other hand, last year, she went to Havana, Cuba, right when Obama had opened up Cuba. And all the celebrities were on their Kardashian. We're going down there. And then Diesel and all these guys, because Cuba was all of a sudden the hottest tourist destination on Earth for the coolest people on Earth. And there was a gigantic Chanel fashion show in Havana, which amounted to a huge tourism commercial Mm -hmm. for the Cuban regime. And for the benefit of our listeners, the tourism industry in Cuba is owned almost lock, stock, and barrel by the, not only by the regime, but by the Castro family and their military cronies, military and secret police. So almost every dollar, loony, everything that is spent in Cuba by tourists lands in the pockets of the mass murdering, terror sponsoring Castro regime. So to compound for advertising a Che Guevara on her rear end. Mm-hmm. Giselle Bunchen goes down there and makes a tourism commercial for the regime co-founded by Che Guevara. Again, chances are she didn't know right. that, that the tourism revenue ends up in the pocket. You know, typical Ma, she's probably not worried about that kind of stuff, but, uh, but I do. And so I'm going to publicize it to publicize my book. So mm-hmm. people will learn these things. And remind people what your book is called, by the way. Well, I have six of them, but the one we're referencing today is called Exposing the Real Che Guevara and the Useful Idiots <laughs> Idolize. My, my uh, website, hfontova.com, has got them all listed. There's a Mac one, the, the one that just came out last month. It's got the blurb written by Ted Nugent. It's called Crazy on the Bayou. Mm-hmm. Five seasons of Louisiana hunting, fishing, and feasting. I've got chapters devoted 
chapter, hunting ducks, hunting deer, hunting nutria, fishing, and at the end of every chapter, I've got a recipe, a Cuban Cajun recipe for the creature, the prey creature involved. Nice. I didn't even know there was a Cajun, uh, uh, Q- Cajun Cuban cuisine, but okay. There isn't. There isn't. I made it up. The only place you'll find it is in my book. All right. That's so the beauty of this. There is no such cuisine. It's mine. Mine. I originated. I publicized it. It's in my book. And Ted Nugent wrote the blurb. Crazy on the Bayou. We even have a video of it on uh, on YouTube. Right. We had a pilot that was going to be, there was a chance it was going to be a reality TV show at one time, and it still might, so we shot a pilot for it, and that's on YouTube, Crazy on the Bayou. I think our listeners would be fascinated. Definitely. Hey, one more thing before I forgot. It's a good thing that uh, Tom Brady didn't share some uh, with his black teammates, of which there are many, not as many as on other teams in the NFL, that he didn't share some of the things Che Guevara had to say about black people, which people often forget about. The Negro is indolent and lazy and spends his money on frivolities and drink, and he has maintained his racial purity throughout history by his habit of not taking baths. Che Guevara. The guy who black activists and the black, uh, black Lives Matter love to wear him on their chest. They love to wear him on their chest. The guy who considered them stupid, frivolous, and stinky. And they love to wear him on his chest. Oh, we have so much fun with that. We have so much fun. Would you can't not, make it up. Would not go over well in an NFL locker room. All right, oh, Umberto, <laughs> Umberto Fontova, thanks for joining me, and uh, happy end of the NFL season, though I guess for your purposes it ended more like uh, close to three weeks ago, but we won't go into that right now. All right, buddy, thanks a lot. All right, thanks for joining me. See ya.